this class and to learn about present truth. And I pray that you bless each one of us, bless, uh, grant us the Holy Spirit, and I ask that you bless Brother Jeff as he speaks to us, and I pray that you be with us throughout today and help us to glorify you in all things. And I ask that you forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Who wants to go first? You, Brother Philip? Oh, uh, again? <laughs> again? Yeah. Oh, no, no, that last time was... I would try. You try? Yeah. Um, should I go with the Acts of the Apostles? Or? Whatever you want to start with. Okay. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 1 through 7. Unto the angel of the church, as Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, thy labors, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And thou, uh, and thou has hast born. born, yeah, and hast uh, labored, patience. Uh, as has patience, and for my name's sake, has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, that, okay. that thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore whence thou art fallen, and do the first, and, and repent. repent. Oh, where was that? Do the first word. That's the next verse. Ah, do the first, and repent. Um, and repent and do the and first works. Repent word. and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will take the candlestick. We will remove. I will remove the candlestick. Thy candlestick. Thy candlestick, out of his place. Except. Uh, except I repent. Um, it's it's the. Uh, except I repent. But. But, this thing has thou. That thou, thou hast. Hast, thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. <coughs> he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Unto him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I think that was the verse. So, and uh, the Acts of the Apostles for... I don't remember. 585. Yeah, for 585. Um, the names of the churches, seven. the names of the churches are symbolic of the church and the different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages e extend to the end of time. Uh, while the symbols used, um, the symbols used indicate reveal, reveal uh, the church's condition in in uh, the different periods of this world's history. I think I changed the topic. Yeah, the, the, the thought was right. The words were kicked around. <laughs> Christ is. Uh, Christ uh, is spoken of as walking in the midst of uh, the golden candlesticks. Thus he symbolized his relation to the churches. He is uh, in constant communion with his people. He observes their order. He knows, he knows their order. Oh. Oh. He what? knows their true state. Oh, he knows their true state. He observes their order, their piety, their devotion um, while he is priest although, although he is uh, the high priest and mediator in the sanctuary above he is symbolized yet he as, yet he is symbolized as walking represented up, yes he is represented as walking up and down in the midst of his churches on the earth who's next 
Didn't Jim want to do it? Jim, you ready? I'm not ready. <coughs> Brittany? Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne in his patience, and for my name's sake hast, um, has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Do the first works works. Um, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and do the first works. What's the next word? Or else. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick from his place. Out of his place. Out of his place. Except thou repent. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Unto. Unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Um, Acts of the Apostles, 585 to 586. The, the names. The names of the seven churches are symbolize symbolize the church. Symbolic. Are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time, while the symbols used while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. Christ is spoken of as walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Thus is symbolized. Thus symbol. Thus is symbolized his relation to the churches. He he is in constant communication with his people. He knows their true state. He observes their order, their piety, their devotion. Although he is high priest and mediator in the sanctuary above, yet he is represented as walking up and down in the midst of his churches on the earth. Acts of the Apostles 585 to 586. Good. You ready, Michael? Sorry. Are you ready? Come on, Catherine. Tyler? Nope. Tommy? I'm not ready to Jack? Okay. Paul? <coughs> Can't see Paul. Oh, yeah, he was <laughs> bent over behind me. Um, the, the reason we were a little bit late is our printer, printer is jammed. And I could not get it on jet. I tried. So I want to read through something and I'll just hand out as many as I got, have. Patrick told us that was the reason you were late. Pardon me? Patrick told us that was the reason you were late. That, that because our printer was late? Yeah. Right? Yeah. How did yeah. you know that? Prophesied. <laughs> <laughs> How would you know? Statistics. <laughs> You have the email you can read from? Yep. Out. Oh. So, the notes are in the email. Yeah, this is a crazy argument that I've dealt with repeatedly through the years. And from my human evaluation, it's based upon <coughs> Seventh-day Adventists that are unwilling to admit that this Sunday law is where their probation closes. But they use this to misrepresent 
the truth about the image of the beast in Revelation 13. And Michael was dealing with someone online about this question. And from my understanding, Michael should have already known this because we went over all these principles over the trimesters that he's been here. But it's probably a good thing to put in place. So um, this is the logic that I use when I'm confronted with Generally, it's, from my perspective, people that are trying to fight the idea that probation closes at the Sunday law. Um, so we'll just read one verse, a little comment as we go through the... What? Yep. So they're not talking about Adventists, then, based on your statement, because you're, you're talking about probation closing at the Sunday law. I was thinking you were going to say before the Sunday law. So these people are not talking about SDAs, then. Right. Yeah, they are. Yeah, and technically your probation settles before the Sunday law. But their argument is is that the door doesn't close at the Sunday law. You know, you, they first have to see that before they understand their character. It's got to even be settled before the Sunday law. That's simply the crisis where it's going to be man demonstrated, manifested. Um, so I'm not dealing with that fine detail. Um, and maybe that's not the, the motivation behind, behind the guy that Michael's dealing with. And you may not, until we get through it, understand this is about Revelation 13. This is where they make their argument. And they misrepresent a spirit of prophecy quote or two. There's other ones they do the same thing with. I mean, there's spirit of prophecy quotes where if you read it, it appears grammatically. This is another example of a, a misrepresentation of her works. It appears grammatically that the last thing that Christ does in the most holy place is he blots out sin, he seals everybody, he stands up, and probation's closed. And by that, it, it's, it's taught by people that believe that, that the sealing takes place simultaneously for every human being, Adventist and non-Adventist. Non and they're all sealed, his work is finished. And it destroys everything that she says about people with the seal of God giving a warning message to the 11th hour workers. But in a couple passages in the Spirit of Prophecy where all she is doing is focusing on the very last activities of Christ and blotting out sin and finishing the work, if you want to read that idea in there and avoid all the other passages where his work is defined in a real detailed process, then you can do that. And that's kind of what these people try to do with Revelation 13. But, maybe you'll see what I'm talking about when we go through this. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. And you will have read every one of these, but read the next one. Do you have, you, did I give you one? No, I didn't give them on that side. Patrick. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time and, like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be, to be present truth till the close of time. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy, and their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angel's messages are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with this which follows. The third angel proclaims his warning with a loud voice. After these things, said John, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. In this illumination, the light of all three messages is combined. So what's the last two quotes teach? That. The Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world. Yeah. But it, what, what's the distinction between those two co quotes? One's talking about the parable of the ten virgins from Matthew 25, and the other one's talking about the three angels from Revelation 13, which are both illustrations of the Millerite history. So Matthew 25 was fulfilled in the Millerite history, so was Re the angels of Revelation 14, and they're both repeated at the end of the world. Okay, the next quote's going to tie both those together. It's not the only place she does it. Type Matthew 25 and Revelation 14 together. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the messages of the first and second angels refused the third angel's message, the last testing message to be given to the world. The parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself 
and every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. So she tied the three angels' messages in Matthew 25 together, and but here she's putting a special emphasis on the closed door in the parable. And the third angel's message is the closed door. It says, if you receive the mark of the beast, you're going to get the wrath of God. So those line up. Okay. Brother Jason. There have been and always will be tares among the wheat, the foolish, the <coughs> foolish virgins with the wise, those who have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. So what's that teaching? That the tares are the ground. foolish and the wheat are the wise. Okay. Interchangeable symbols. Sister Kathy. Trials are to come upon God's people and the tares are to be separated from the wheat. So Kathy, what is it that separates the wheat and tares? Trial. Trial. Yeah. Kathy. What's a trial? It's a Pardon me? It's a testing. Test. It's a test. In, a, in a, a couple of, a couple of uh, quotes before, it says, Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the first and second angels refused the third angel's message, the last test. testing message to be given to the world. It's so it's a testing time period. Um, and that's the testing is what separates the wheat from the tares. And the wheat and tares are the wise and foolish virgins. Who, Tyler? Let both tares and wheat grow together until the harvest. Then it is the angels that do the work of separation. What angels do the work of separation? The three angels. Three angels. The three angels. The messages. Um, Philip? Uh, then I saw the third angel. Said my accompanying angel, Fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garden. These things should engross the whole mind and the whole attention. It's the third angel where the binding takes place. Brother Jim? <coughs> to John, we're open the scenes of deep and thrilling interest in the experience of the church. He saw the position, dangers, conflicts, and final deliverance of the people of God. He records the closing messages which are to ripen the harvest of the earth, either as sheaves for the heavenly garner or as faggots for the fire of destruction. Great country. So what's the sheaves? They'd be wheat. Wise virgins, the faggots, the foolish virgins, the tares. The, the, that quote is very, that's a very important quote before we move away from it. Not really on the point I'm going to make, but what does this point teach? Teach. What does this last quote from Great Controversy 341 teach? That three angels' messages ripen the harvest. Earth. Yes, but there's something else in there that's worth noting. What does what does John record? The closing the message. That what? Spirit. The harvest. So so what is the messages in the Book of Revelation? <laughs> The, position, the, the messages that ripen the harvest? Yeah, so what's the messages that ripen the harvest? It's the latter rain. The book of Revelation is the latter rain. John records the closing messages that are to ripen the harvest of the earth. You see it? Yeah. Because she says in another place that it's the latter rain that ripens. Yep. There Sister Brittany? Again, these parables. Mm -hmm. Again, these parables teach that there is to be no probation after the judgment. When the work of the gospel is completed, there immediately follows a separation between the good and the evil, and the destiny of each class is forever fixed. So, at the judgment, probation ends, whatever the judgment is. And what's the judgment based upon what we've been reading? It's the, the third, third angel. It's when the door closes at the third angel. And how, how is that expressed in John 16, 8? The Holy Spirit's come to convict the world of sin, sin righteousness, righteousness, and judgment. At, at judgment, what is there no longer? Probation. Probation, Probation closes at the third step. Brother Paul? A time is coming when the law of God is, in a special sense, to be made void in our land. The rulers of our nation will, by legislative enactments, enforce the Sunday law. 
and thus God's people will be brought into great peril. When our nation, in its legislative councils, shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance, and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath, the law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land, and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. View and Herald, December 18, 1888. This is, this is actually defining the Sunday law that fulfills Revelation 13, 11. This is the Sunday law where you're going to manifest as an Adventist in the United States, whether you have a character prepared for the mark or the seal. It has two components to it. What are the two components, Brother Tyler? To what? To, to the Sunday law? Yeah. It, it binds the conscience. No. Persecution. Enforcing Sunday observance and persecuting, persecuting oh, Sabbath keepers. It's got to be those two steps. And Brother Tyler said something wrong in his sermon yesterday, and I asked him about it, and he said it because he believed it, and maybe everyone else believes it. But it's, I, he, I know he can't sustain it, and I'm not being critical of him, I'm just making sure everyone understands that at the image of the beast test, there's going to be a series of Sunday laws that lead to this Sunday law. And at this Sunday law, your probation as a Seventh-day Adventist closes. This is the Sunday law in a special sense. But the Sunday laws that lead to this Sunday law, he said, were passed in the states. That's not so. It's, even in this one it says, when our nation and its legislative councils shall enact laws, okay, there will be Sunday laws, no doubt, in the states that are part of the image of the beast testing process, but it isn't exclusively the states. The federal government's going to be passing, <coughs> escalating Sunday laws too. So he was making a distinction about the Sunday laws in the state, in the states themselves being the image of the beast test, and then when it gets to the federal Sunday law, this one here, that is a Sunday law. I don't think you can uphold that. It's, it's both state and federal. Minor point. But who's next? Go ahead. If the light of truth has been presented to you, revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and showing that there is no foundation in the Word of God for Sunday observance, and yet you still cling to the full Sabbath, refusing to keep holy the Sabbath which God calls my holy day, you receive the mark of the beast. When does this take place? When you know that there is not a word in the Bible showing no. Sunday. No, when you, you obey. obey. When you obey the decree that command you to cease from labor on Sunday and worship God, while you know there is not a word in the Bible showing Sunday to be other than a common working day, you consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. If we receive this mark in our foreheads or in our hands, the judgment pronounced against the disobedient must fall upon us. But the seal of the living God is placed upon those who conscientiously keep the Sabbath of the Lord. <clears throat> she makes this statement in a couple, of, I don't remember how many places, a few. But I use this one from Review and Herald because the editors of the Review and Herald back there in 1911, they're the ones that I tell us, italicized these phrases in here. That's not me. They did it for emphasis. And they're emphasizing exactly the point that I'm trying to make with this quote is when do you get the mark of the beast? When does this take place? When you obey the decree that commands you to cease from labor. Okay, that's when you get the mark of the beast, or that's when you get the seal of, God, seal of God. You either accept the one or refuse the other, or vice versa, at the Sunday law, which is the Sunday law that forces you to observe Sunday and persecutes you for keeping Sabbath. What are you doing, brother, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are united with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and 
purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heaven, heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their forehead. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, these characters will remain pure and spotless for eternity. Testimonies, Volume 5, 216. So, you shouldn't have to make this point, but you need to make this point. If you go back to the previous quote, there's a part of it where it says, while you know that there's not a word in the Bible showing Sunday to be other than a work, common working day, you consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. So you have, at the Sunday law, you have a choice of going one direction or the other, mark of the beast or seal of God. And then here in Testimonies, Volume 5, it says, if you receive the seal of God, your character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. So what's the, the opposite of that? If you receive the mark of the beast, your character is going to remain right. corrupt for eternity. That's the close of probation. There is no probation after the judgment. The door closes at the Sunday law. The midnight cry was not so much carried by argument, though the scripture proof was clear and conclusive. There went with it, we're switching gears here, there went with it an impelling power that moved the soul. There was no doubt, no questioning. Upon the occasion of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the people who were assembled from all parts of the land to keep the feast flocked to the Mount of Olives, and as they joined the throng that were escorting Jesus, they caught the inspiration of the hour and helped to swell the, cry, the shout, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In like manner did unbelievers who flocked to the Adventist meeting, some from curiosity, some merely to ridicule, feel the convincing power attending the message, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. What did she just do? Compare it to the midnight cry to the triumphal entry. Okay, same history. Brother Patrick. The judgment of which Egypt had first been warned was to be the last visited. Was to be the last visited. God is long suffering and plenteous in mercy. He has a tender care for the beings formed in his image. If the loss of their harvests and their flocks and herds had brought Egypt to repentance, the children would not have been smitten. But the nation had stubbornly resisted the divine command, and now the final blow was about to fall. What was the final blow? That's the firstborn. When did that take place? On the first Passover. So it was typifying what? The cross. The cross. And what's the triumphal entry? It's the history that leads up to the cross. So what are these plagues that were being poured out on Egypt? They're the triumphal entry. They're the midnight cry. Probation's still open. If they would have responded to those plagues, they wouldn't have lost the firstborn. So probation's open in the midnight cry, but it closes at the final blow at Passover at the cross. Upon us is shining the accumulated rays, accumulated light of past ages. The record of Israel's forgetfulness has been preserved for our enlightenment. In this age, God has set in his hand to gather unto himself a people from every nation, kindred, and tongue. In the Advent movement, he, was wrought, he has wrought for his heritage, even as he wrought for the Israelites in leading them from Egypt. In the great disappointment of 1844, the faith of his people was tested, as was the Hebrews at the Red Sea. So, the disappointment at the Red Sea is the disappointment of October 23rd, 1844. It's the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross. Three parallel histories. Probation closed at the cross at Passover on October 22nd, 1844. <coughs> yes? Yeah. At the anti-deliverance believed the warning and repented of the evil deeds, the Lord would have turned aside his wrath as he afterward did from Nineveh. But by the obstinate the resistance to the reproofs of conscience <coughs> and the warnings of God's prophet, that generation filled up the measure of their iniquity and became ripe for destruction. What generation? 
before. 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 Plot. Yeah, but I mean, the, what, who's, this, who's the messenger here? Noah. 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 And one of the things that they're doing is they fight Mo Noah's message is what? Tyler dealt with this a little bit in his sermon yesterday. They filled up their cup, okay, the, the cup of their probationary time. The period of their probation was about to expire. Noah had faith, faithfully followed the instructions which he had received from God. The ark was finished in every part as the Lord had directed and was stored with food for man and beast. And now the servant of God made his last solemn appeal to the people. With an agony of desire that words cannot express, he entreated them to seek a refuge while it might be found. Again, they rejected his words and raised their voices in jest and scoffing. <clears throat> so so where, where is he? In the prophetic line, where is Noah right now? I mean, I cry. He's in the midnight cry. He's given their final warning. They, they, in theory, they could have repented right then and there. But what are they doing? They're mocking. They're mocking. <clears throat> Suddenly a silence fell upon the mocking throng, beasts of every description. The fiercest, as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from mountain and forest and quietly making their way toward the ark. A noise as of... A noise as of a rushing wind was heard, and lo, birds were flocking from all directions. Their numbers darkening the heavens, and in perfect order they passed to the ark. Animals obeyed the command of God, while men were disobedient. Guided by holy angels, they went in two and two until Noah's, two and two, unto yeah. Noah into the ark, and the clean beasts by sevens. The world looked on in wonder, some in fear. Philosophers were called upon to account for the singular occurrence, but in vain. It was a mystery which they could not fathom, but men had become so hardened by their persistent rejection of light that even this scene produced but a momentary impression. As the doomed race beheld the sun shining in its glory, and the earth clad in almost even beauty, they banished their rising fears by boisterous merriment, and by their deeds of violence they seemed to invite upon themselves the visitation of the already awakening wrath of God. So what is this? What's this history he just it, said? It is the, <coughs> it is the visual test. The visual test. test that leads to the closed <coughs> door. <coughs> yes. Okay, it's a visual test. Yes. Kathy, don't say nothing. Okay. Is the midnight cry a visual test? What's that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? The image of the beast. Now you know. Now you switch to the image of the beast. Is the midnight cry a visual test? The living testimony. That happened. But in the parable of the ten virgins, what happens? There is a cry at midnight. Then what happens? All the vir virgins awake. And what do they do? They what? Okay. They, what's that mean? They have light to see. Do they? All of them do? Five of, them do. five of them have oil, and five of them don't have oil. And what does that produce? Super. Two classes that either can see or can't see. It's a visual test. You either have light or you don't have light. It's about being able to see. Isn't that what you use the lamp for at midnight? Yep. Is to see. Okay, it's a visual test. Next. God commanded Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Noah's warnings had been rejected by the world, but his influence and example resulted in blessings to his family. As a result, I mean, as a reward for his faithfulness and integrity, God saved all the members of his family with him. What encouragement to parental fidelity. Amen. Men had ceased in pleading. Mercy. What? Mercy. Oh, mercy, sorry. Mercy had ceased its pleadings for the guilty race. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air had entered the place of refuge. Noah and his household were within the ark, and the Lord shut him in. A flash of dazzling light was seen, and a cloud of glory more vivid than the lightning descended from heaven and hovered over, hovered before the entrance of the ark. The massive door, which it was impossible for those within to close, was slowly swung to its place by unseen hands. Noah was shut in, and the rejectors of mercy, God's mercy were shut out. The seal of heaven was on that door. God had shut it, and God alone could open it. 
So when Christ shall cease his intercession for guilty man, men, before his coming in the clouds of heaven, the doors of mercy will be shut. Then divine grace will no longer restrain the wicked, and Satan will have full control of those who have rejected mercy. They will endeavor to destroy God's people, but as Noah was shut into the ark, so the righteous will be shielded by divine power. So you have a bunch of really important symbols in there. Shut in, shut out, door closes, judgment, no probation afterwards, but he puts his seal up on that door. Uh, you can show that the blood at Passover in Egypt was the seal. The Sunday law is the seal, but people will use the people. That, the reason we're doing this is those that class of Adventists that try to fight the truth about probation closing at the Sunday law will take a passage like this and say this closed door. That's when Michael stands up and probation's been open for all mankind until he stands up and then they shut the door and it's all over. They disregard the progressive nature of the close of probation because it buys them some more time, I assume, to continue to play around with sin, but uh, it ain't gonna, it ain't gonna really buy them anything. Um, okay, we're at the same subject, but we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Brother Jim, or Philip, Brother Philip, I think. The Amorites were inhabitants of Canaan, and the Lord had promised the land of Canaan to the Israelites. But a long interval must pass before his people should possess the land. He stated the reason why this interval must pass. He told them that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full, and the expulsion and extermination could not be justified until they had filled up the cup of their iniquity. Idolatry and sin marked their course. Well, but while we're here... Keep your finger there. What causes them to fill up the... What causes you and I to fill up the cup of our iniquity? Idolatry and sin. Our increased sinfulness. What is it that, that separates the, the wise and the foolish? Trials. Tests. There's a testing process that fills up our cup of probationary time, one way or the other. How we relate to the testing process. So... Um, the test of the three angels' messages. But who delivers the three angels' messages? It's people. Yeah, you can't separate the trumpet from the trumpeter. I mean, you can, but you're not going to have a noise. You can't separate the message from the messenger. That's why in Tyler's sermon yesterday, when he's pointing out that Nehemiah is a cupbearer, the fact that he's a cupbearer for the king is saying that he's representing someone that is giving this testing message that is going to produce two classes of worshipers in that history. It's, it's the symbol of the testing message that binds them off. Go ahead. Idolatry and sin marked their course, but the measure of their guilt was not such that they could be devoted to destruction. In His love and pity, God would let light shine upon them in more distinct rays. And this, you'll see that what's bold-faced here and what's bold-faced in the next quote is the point I'm trying to emphasize. He would give them opportunity to behold the working of His wondrous power, that there might be no excuse for their course of evil. What's behold me? Visual. 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 Yeah. Okay. You got have to have a visual test. Go ahead. It is thus that Lord deals with nations. Every one of them. Though a certain period of probation through, through, sorry, through a certain period of probation, he exercises long suffering toward nations, cities and individuals. But when it is evident that they will not come unto him that they may have life, judgments are visited upon them. <coughs> the time came when judgment was inflicted upon the Amorites. And the time will come when all the transgressors of his law will know that God will by no means clear the guilty. So before the judgment was inflicted upon the Amorites, what did he first do? Give them a visual test. Give them a visual <coughs> test. So how's that line up with Noah? There's the animals in the ark. Same story. God's dealings with men is ever yeah, the, same. the same. There's always a visual test. Brother Jim? 
of the Amorites, the Lord said, In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Although the nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled up the cup of its iniquity, and God would not give command for its utter destruction. The people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner, that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with her iniquity until the fourth generation. Then if no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to fall upon them. Testimonies 5 and 5. There's always a visual test that leads to the cup being full. Con conspicuous. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Is that conspicuous or cons I conspicuous? Conspicuous. It was? No, it wasn't real conspicuous, but the word was conspicuous. Where is the Chicago? Word? The second um, line, although this nation was conspicuous. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but that isn't a word, is it? Oh, I, would, I was not? thinking, man, What's I've never that heard mean? that word before. What does the I wouldn't I pronounce it the I, same that's as you. you read it I was that way, all right? That's a new word. No, that's got to be a typo, I think. Is conspicuous <laughs> a word? I'll let you know. I was thinking it should be. Yes. <laughs> I'm with you, too. Sometimes <laughs> Sister Wright has these words that are words. And a third grade education. It's spelled that way. It's suspicious. A word. It's conspicuous. Yeah. Oh, that's how you spell it. Is okay. That how you spell conspicuous? So this is where we're getting to. This is the crux of the of where we're heading, this next quote, which Brittany's going to read to us. And we're all familiar with this quote. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. Your position is just a jumble of inconsistencies that but a few but few will be deceived. In Revelation thirteen the subject is plainly presented. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God, Jehovah, and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. So, when are you sealed? When the test is brought to you. Yeah, in the, in the story of Noah, when there's the seal placed? When the door is shut. Oh, sure. When the door is shut, the seal is placed. <coughs> God's dealing with men are ever the same. So before he closes the door and the seal is placed, what does there have to be? A visual test. A manifestation of his power. A visual test. And the image of the beast is the test God's people must pass before they're sealed. And before probation closes. And the image of the beast test is the test by which what? Our eternal destiny. Our eternal destiny is decided. decided. And what does where does she place in the scriptures the image of the beast test? Where does she locate it? Revelation, Revelation 13, 13, 11 through 17. And we'll we'll get to that after we read through those quotes. Well, what people do here is they take Revelation 13, 11 through 17. And for years, I mean for years, to make this point, and this is a common, common place where people fight. Um, I would read Revelation 13, 11 through 17, and then I'd ask a question. Let's, let's read it. I'll ask the question. And, and because you guys know what's going on, you'll probably ask, answer the question correctly. Unless you want to no, but you won't allow the, the, the demonstration of the point because you, you're too educated in this regard. Who? Brother Paul, Revela I'll read it. Everyone there, Revelation 13, 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dra dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both 
speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And that no man might buy it or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Then I would ask the question, how many images of the beast are in this passage? And I don't mean count how many times the expression the image of the beast is mentioned. How many times is the image how many images of the beast here are addressed? Two. Ah. One. one. Is the everyone gives the answer one. But see, you know, that's what I'm saying. You guys are familiar with this. Most Adventists, if they're if they're focusing in on this and they read it carefully, they're only gonna see one. Where do you see two? I mean you basically <laughs> can imply it also just from context that before the United States speaks as a dragon. Yeah, see that's what I'm getting at. Is you know that. But most Adventists, 95% of them, if they read this, they're not going to have the prophetic context to say that when the United States speaks as a dragon, that's proof that it's built an image of the beast in the United States. And they'll say one. And that, so I would always ask that question to, to show that there are two in this passage. There has to be two. When the United States speaks as a dragon, that is the Sunday law, and we're going to read passages here where Sister White says the Sunday law in the United States is the evidence that the Protestant churches have formed an image of the beast. So even though it isn't in Revelation 13, it's there in the prophetic record. It has to be, this is the argument. This is, the, this is the argument people are fighting about, that Michael's dealing with. So, whose turn? Paul. In order for the United States to form an image to the, of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Is that talking about the world or the United States? United States. United States. Yes. Brother, sister, tell me. The enforcement of Sunday keeping on the part of Protestant churches is an enforcement of the worship of the papacy, of the beast. Those who, understanding the claims of the fourth commandment, choose to observe the false instead of the true Sabbath, are thereby paying homage to that power by which alone it is commanded. But in the very act of enforcing a religious duty by secular power, the churches with themselves form an image to the beast. Hence, the enforcement of Sunday keeping in the United States would be an enforcement of the worship of the beast and its image. What is the enforcement of Sunday keeping in the United States? How is it expressed in Revelation 13 and 11? Speaks as a dragon. The speaking, when the United States speaks as a dragon in verse 11, it says, but the very act of them doing this is the forming of the image of the beast. Brother Jack? When the churches of our land unite upon the, such points of faith as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and statutes sustain sustain their institutions when then will Protestant America Protestant America have formed an image to the to the Roman hierarchy, hierarchy Spirit of Prophecy Volume four two seventy nine. Did it not the if, you're, if you've looked on the MSN website this morning, Friday, Sabbath, this morning, there's a Republican House of Representative woman from California, and the liberals are chastising her severely. What, what are they chastising her for? Maxine? Is that who you're referring to? I don't, I don't remember her name. You're thinking Maxine Waters? No, they wouldn't. The liberals wouldn't chastise her. All they do is praise her. Okay. This is this is a Republican. Oh, okay. All right. And what they're chastising her for is she at some meeting said that the drought in California is a judgment of God. Ooh. And they're they're chastising her for bad science and for 
being a Bible thumper and so on and so forth. But what is that? That's evidence that the political leaders are starting to turn their focus on the problems to be God's judgments. Okay, it, it, it's it's going to escalate where everything's going to get blamed upon God's people that are representatives of God and the judgments in the land. That's what liberal press isn't saying anything like that, but that's what it is. Um, whose turn? My turn? Yep. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. Do you, you realize that it would... Well, I don't, I don't want to be political, but... You know, Obama's a hard enough pill to swallow, but... If Hillary is the next president, that's that that you meet a a harder pill to swallow. But uh, the way the last two elections have went, if it, if that doesn't fly, if the Clintons don't pull off one of their magical works, this government is going to be set just where it's ready to go with end time Bible prophecy. If the Republicans continue to take control and then there's some judgments in the land, it's all in place. Anyway, historical events were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. Prophecy is historical events and you can see the history on the horizon that corresponds to what we're teaching here if you're willing to see. The, the last few elections, the last couple of elections, we we have recognized that it was set, set up to where things could start happening and I believe, probably everyone else agrees, it's, it's only from God's mercy that he's held that back. But you can see, and there will become a time where he, he will have to, the cup will be full as we're talking about. But can he hold it back? Yeah, he can. Can he? He has. Yeah. Because we know in 9-11 it was ready. Yeah, of course he can hold it back. I mean, but, but his, his mercy... But Luke 21 says, so it's long. this generation this shall generation, not that's pass. That's right. I'm just saying that we, we've been seeing this, this political setup, that it, things could have happened a while back, but in his mercy he's held it back. Brother Patrick, As this, is, this is a key point. <clears throat> As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the fourth Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. There's something that happens in the United States that's an example of what happens to every other nation in the world. And what she's talking about is the Sunday law. But the quote that Brindy read... The Sunday Law is where we get the seal, and the Lord showed her clearly that the image of the beast is formed before probation closed. That happens in the United States, and what is it? It's the visual test, it's the manifestation of God's power that the Amorites get to see, the animals getting on the ark before the door closes, and every nation in the world, it goes through that identical process. Four nations will follow the example of the United States, though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon the people in all parts of the land, our people in all parts of the world. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp, to clasp hands with the spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehood and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that the end is near. 
When does Satan's marvelous working begin? After Sunday law. After Sunday law. What is Satan's marvelous working? Verse 13 and 14 of Revelation 13. So he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them which dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do inside of the beast. What, what is verse 13? Where is verse 13? It's two verses after verse 11. Immediately after the Sunday law in the United States, both the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy teach, then the marvelous working of Satan arrives. And who's the Antichrist? Papacy. Papacy, Papacy. Papacy. oh, is it? John says there's many Antichrists. He's the Antichrist. He's the, spiritual the, the Pope is the Antichrist? The seat of the Pope. The seat of the Pope? Okay, I just want you to understand Satan's the Antichrist too. Yeah. And sometimes Sister White, when she's using the expression Antichrist, she's talking about Satan. And sometimes she's talking about the Pope. And you have to make the distinction because we're going to look at that now. Now, the, the, this next... We were uh, talking a little... Or I was asking a question on this subject yesterday about when Satan comes to impersonate. And I thought I recalled that it's when there was a lot of strife and war uh, in effect. Um, so, and we just said it's after the, the, the Sunday Law issue. <clears throat> so we did sense that, you know, there's a bigger escalation militarily, globally, at that, at that point in time, more than we're, we're seeing now. And yeah. not necessarily having anything to do with this. Well, yeah. The, the, when I was cutting and, pa cutting and pasting from different notes that I have to put this together. And this last quote that we read, typically in my notes I have two, maybe three other quotes that talk about the Sunday Law and the Threefold Union. This is the one I kept because I want to emphasize that at the Sunday Law, the marvelous working of Satan begins. But the other ones emphasize that national apostasy is followed by national ruin. Okay, at the Sunday Law, it's national ruin. You work in the financial industry. What happens when the financial industry of the United States goes? The whole world goes. If the United States sneezes, the world gets a cold. Okay, so at that point, everything comes unclued. A and, domino effect. and Satan is there saying, I'm Christ. These judgments are because those guys over there are refusing to keep Sunday holy and make it crazy. But this next, this next passage is it's the last paragraph from a chapter in the Great Controversy and the first paragraph of a next chapter in Great Controversy. And if you just start in the one chapter, you may not see the connection, but the last paragraph of this, that we're, the first one we're going to read here, is marking the Sunday Law. And then the first paragraph of the next chapter is teaching something that follows the Sunday Law. But if you're just reading chapter by, you know, if the chapter break may lead you to not get the connection of the sequence of events, and I want you to see it. Who's turn to read? Jason. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive en enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and re legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the law to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, Revelation twelve seventeen. What's that paragraph? It's a Sunday law. Yeah. Sister Kathy? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible for its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. At every revival of God, of God's work, 
the prince of evil is around, oh, is aroused to more intense activity. He is now putting forth his utmost efforts for the final struggle against Christ and his followers. The last great delusion is soon to be open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. Who is this Antichrist? Satan. Man. Pardon Satan. me? This is Satan. This is Satan. Yeah. It says at that bottom, the bottom line, that's what I thought, and then it said, by their testimony. No. Making it seem like it's a plurality of... No, 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 by yeah. the Scripture's testimony. Oh, by the, by the Scripture's testimony. Okay. Yeah. Next, next quote. Yeah. Fallen angels upon earth form confederations with evil men. In this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ. Who's that? Satan. Satan. Go ahead. And then the law of God will be fully made void in the nations of our world. Now, I want, uh, you won't believe that this particular little subject here, you probably won't believe, got argued with and argued with and argued with. This was a subject that had to be defended. And so, if you go in to make this defense, <coughs> and you find every place in the spirit of prophecy, which I have done, where Sister White talks about Satan personating Christ, you will find that sometimes he do, it doesn't mention that he's leading the world to pass a Sunday law. Sometimes that's not there. But every time the Sunday law issue is marked, it's as this one. It says, the law of God will be made fully void in the nations of our world. Never one time does she speak of Satan personating Christ in order to get the United States to pass a Sunday law? Because when Satan personates Christ, the United States has already passed a Sunday law. He's only personating Christ in the time period when he's forcing the nations of the world to pass a Sunday law. That's what's going on here. You want to read that thing again, please? Sorry. Fallen angels upon earth form confederations with evil men. In this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ, and then the law of God will be, made, will be fully made void in the nations of our world. Rebellion against God's holy law will be fully ripe. But the true leader of all this rebellion is Satan, clothed as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him to, place, to the place of God and defy him. Deify. Deify. Deify him, sorry. So he appears right Deify. before the universal Sunday law. He appears he right after the Sunday law in the United States and professes to be Christ and start, starts pushing the nations all to get in line with, with the Sunday law. In the time period where national apostasy is followed by national ruin, wars are taking place, the whole world's coming apart. He's there on the scene. Um, in, in the terms of the progression uh, uh, of the Sunday Law, do we have a sense of which stage that is? I know. It's after the Sunday Law in the United States, before. You know, as Michael they begin to up. fines and imprisonment and so on and so forth, do we have a sense of which level that's at? It sounds like it will be the universal Sunday Law because it says that the nations of our world. The law of God will be fully made void in the nations of our world. That'd be the in, this, that'd in this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ, and then he appears before. It's his activity that pushes the nations to do the universal Sunday law. Yeah. And Sister White also says his revelation is not just one time, but many times. Yeah. She will, she will right. pops up here and then here. Yeah, it'd be in Germany and then in Bolivia. So who's being it, tested? It, it's Adventists in each of the nations. And if it comes to and us, then we have to workers. be able to say, we know who you are, you're not the Christ. Because yeah. she says almost that, that it'll happen that way. Like he will come to us personally and, and we're going to have to reject him personally. Well, Sister White says that he will impersonate dead apostles, that he'll try to bring them back to life to say that God has changed Sabbath to Sunday. You know, the, the, this is 
and we haven't got much time, but just to make a point that has nothing to do with this is those of us that are in this message that really don't know Daniel 11, 40 to 45, we don't understand, probably don't understand the depth of those verses because now people that are in this message that understand Daniel 11, 40 to 45, they understand it correctly perhaps at the surface level. But in uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the same month, the same year, October, when was it? 1917? Mm-hmm. Is when the, the miracle of Fatima was fulfilled. And if you, cha- if you trace the, the message that the, the three children were given about Fatima, that provides the prophetic scenario for the Catholic Church. And you, you can take mm-hmm. details and, and work it through it <clears throat> and show that Satan has prepared the Catholic Church to accept. accept Satan when he they believe that Christ is going to return and call fire down out of heaven and that's what proves that he is Christ. And the implications of this is that because of this, the Catholic Church will then turn the, its whole church structure over to the po- the, to the to Satan to Christ who they believe is Christ and he's the, he's the final pope okay so at that level he's both Satan and and the last pope he he's given that um, position I don't know that that's true but you can see the preparation that Satan has made because he needs an earthly organization both politically the United Nations and religious the Catholic Church to govern the world when he gets here. So he has he has prepared the Catholic mindset for that. And that my, my point in this is, is the preparation of their false prophecy, prophecy, which comes from Fatima, which comes from Daniel 11, verse 40, and the struggle between the king of the north and the king of the south. It's based upon this here, about when Satan comes and personates Christ. It's not a, you know, it's locked into the whole story. I was reading yesterday, and Ellen White was describing Satan when he's about to conquer somebody, and he puts his he puts his um, hand on his chin, and then he gets this evil smile, and she she it was such an evil smile, and it gets bigger and bigger, that she could hardly even describe it, but you know the wickedness that is going to be going on. But when you think about Satan himself. Doing that, it, it, it's, it's overwhelming to me sometimes. It blows my mind. Okay, whose turn to read? Your turn. And, and I'm on the bottom one. The determination of Antichrist to carry out the rebellion he began in heaven will continue to work on the children of disobedience. <coughs> Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle working demons. <clears throat> the spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. Persians, persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title and worship which belong to the world's redeemer. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the scriptures. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself impersonate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation. In the Revelation, the glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air: "Christ is come! Christ is come!" The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth this voice his yeah. voice his voice is soft and subdued yet full of melody in gentle compassionate tones he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the savior uttered 
he heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion, like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus. The multitudes, from the least to the greatest, give heed to their sorceries, these sorceries, saying, This is the great power of God. Um, I just want to add something real quick. Because the sentence, the glory that surrounds him, is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. Yesterday I shared my testimony and in this dream the devil gave me back then. He actually, I left the powder out and in this dream he, he shoot me the soul of my father. The, obviously it was, it was a deception, but uh, he told me this is the soul of your father and it was, it looked like a, a fire but with very pure bright light. It was consist, it consisted out of very pure bright light and this is exactly the same thing that it is, it was incredible, incredible to behold this and so I can somehow connect with this passage because I have seen it and this is going to be a big deception. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like the triumphal entry of Satan. Yep. And that's what I was thinking. <coughs> now why do you say that? It just sounds like... It sounds like it, but why out? The crowning act. The crowning. It's the crowning act, visual test, but why out? There's one other thing in here that would tell you that this is... You know, let's first put, let's put it in place from the midnight cry of the Sunday law this is Elijah at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal but from the Sunday law to the close of probation this is also Elijah at Mar Mount Carmel okay Elijah's that's fulfilled in both those histories so what's, what's going on when this bright dazzling being arrives in this paragraph what do the people say Christ has come, Christ has come, doubled. Yeah. Mm. So we're in the last paragraph, right? Yep. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshippers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. Brother Jason. Those who keep those who keep God's commandments, those who live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, compose the church of the living God. Those who choose to follow Antichrist are subjects of the great apostate. Ranged under the banner of Satan, they break God's law and lead others to break it. They endeavor so to frame the laws of nations that men shall show their loyalty to earthly governments by trampling upon the laws of of God's kingdom. Satan is diverting minds with unimportant questions in order that they shall not with clear and distinct vision see matters of vast importance. The enemy is planning to ensnare the world. The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. Of this time John the Revelator declares. Okay, let me let me throw in something here that from that from the argument about Daniel eleven in the past. And and I just heard it I just got an email last week from a a Romanian I believe. No, it was from France. It was from France. Not making the argument that it's wrong. The time of the end magazine is wrong because the communism didn't end in 1989. But we never make that claim. It's a misrepresentation of of what we teach about Daniel 11 verse 40. 
But in order to deal with that argument, because you got that argument a lot, well, the king of the south is the king of atheism, you say it was swept away in 1989, but look at communist China, it's still flourishing, it's still growing. In order to eliminate that argument, <clears throat> you had to get into the subject of Christendom. And Sister White talks about Christendom being the, the focus of end time Bible prophecy. And in the time of the Old Testament, the focus was the Middle East. All the stories of the Old Testament are based upon the Middle East, you know, Egypt, Syria, Babylon. But at the end of the world, the focus of Bible prophecy is based upon Christendom. And Christendom is a word that's not just invented by Sister White, it's defined. It's, it's the Americas and it's Europe. Uh, India and China have never been defined as part of Christendom. Okay, it's a, it has a certain focus to it. <clears throat> so there was an argument about that. You had to show that the focus is on Christendom. Communist China isn't even in the prophetic narrative in that sense, even though there's a promise many are going to come from the land of Sinan. The point being here is when you're dealing with the image of the beast test, it's the Protestants in the United States that form the image of the beast and get the Sunday law passed in the United States. <clears throat> but these, these nations that are the Ten Kings, they're also consi considered as Protestants. Okay, This is the work of, of so-called Protestant nations that push this through. And that's what she was just um, referring here to the, the first sentence of that last paragraph. The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive actions. Okay, so these men in authority that are going to enact laws, they're, they're professing to be Christian. So you, this allows you to see her statements about Protestants setting up the image of the beast in both the United States and in the world. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this statement from Great Controversy, page 625, the paragraph, the, sorry, the, one, the, the quote that we read prior to the one that we just read, uh, the last sentence says, his, Satan's blessing is pronounced upon the worshippers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. It's past tense. So he's, it's, she's saying that his blessing will be pronounced after the image is already up. Right? So that this is saying that this, the, the image, the worshippers of the beast and the image has been set up and then he comes. That's after the Sunday law. So that's another evidence that... Yeah. Who's Todd? Okay, uh, Sister Kathy, fire away. Finish those three paragraphs off. We got to get These have them. one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And Every they, nation will be involved. Keep and going. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union. One great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Thus is, thus is manifested the same arbitrary, oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifested by the papacy, when, it, when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. In the warfare to be waged in these last days, it will be united in opposition to God's people, all the corrupt powers and have, that have apostatized from allegiance to the law of Jehovah. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment will be the great point at, it, the great point at issue. For in the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself as the creator of the heavens and, of the, and the earth. And then we've already read these. Is America the land of religious liberty shall unite with the papacy and forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath? The people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. That's what Revelation 13 is not. It's not from Michael standing up. It's the progressive testing of every nation, beginning with the nation where God's people were placed. The glorious land. Brother Jim, you want to talk? Big Father in heaven, uh, again we thank you for this day of life. 
We thank you for your love, grace, and forgiveness. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to hear these truths. And uh, we pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will be in us and let these, these, uh, this, this light that we've been given to settle in and to percolate within us. I pray that you keep us safe from harm and evil and sin as we progress through the day. And uh, I pray that you bless each one of us. I pray this in Jesus' name.